right. Thank you, TJ. And hey, it is great to see you. Let's go ahead and say it. Happy 2021. Can I get a shout out, everybody, you all at home? We want to shout it out and say yes. We've made it. All of you watching online, we do welcome you. You're a big part of what's happening. Grab your Bible. I'm going to be in several passages today and setting up the new year for us. And all of you here in the room, I'm so glad that you're here. It's good to at least see people and be back together a bit, right? So grateful that you're here. You know, I think all of us want to say goodbye to 2020. There's no question about it. As TJ noted, there'd be a lot that we could say about it. But I am, you know, kind of the ultimate optimist. I'm always leaning toward the future, and I just want to encourage us that way. But let's, uh, let's be honest. I just want to ask you the question, you know, how are you, how are you entering into this new year? Uh, because I've talked to several people who are like, you know, I don't know if, it, if this is okay, but I'm not quite ready for 21. Uh, I think a lot of us are still grieving loss that we've experienced in 2020. I think that's going to continue to be the case. And we haven't grieved. The fact that we are entering into this new normal where we've got some work to do because I believe that we'll never quite go back to, to the way things used to be. And I think that's worth wrestling with. I think a lot of people are saying, I should be excited. I want to be excited. I'm setting goals. But 2020 felt like a gut punch. And I'm not sure that I'm really ready. And with all the uncertainties, with this major shift that took place in the past year, I don't know what to expect. I'm not even setting goals this year. I've talked to people across the board. So should we weep? Should we grieve some more? Should we be happy? Should we rejoice? Should we sing? Or should we cry? And I just want to give us all permission today. Whatever your emotion might be, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're sensing, I want to say all emotions are allowed because a lot of us, I think some of us are like, could we just take 2021 off maybe? Like I need a break, right? I just need a break before I move into something else. And I, you know, I've got to admit to you myself, it's like, man, I know we've got work to do in 21. And I, you know, there are days when I'm like, Whew, come on, let's go. Got to give myself this pep talk. Lord, help me. Give me strength. But that's what church does for us. That's what praise does. I'm encouraged today just to sing to the Lord, be reminded of his goodness and the fact that he is with us. He's always been faithful to us. And today I want to talk about how we can be faithful in 21. One. So I'm glad that you're with us, and I hope that you'll continue to remain with us throughout this time, because I believe that if you apply this message to us today uh, that the Lord has for us, it's going to change your life. And I want to talk about how we can approach the coming year. Uh, I think a lot of us have mixed emotions. How shall I feel about the, the coming year? In the field of neurology, uh, there's a condition that's called the pseudo-bulbar effect. It's PBA that's characterized by episodes of uncontrollable emotions that don't, ima- don't match the situation. It happens often in people who have had some kind of trauma to the brain, neurological problems of some sort that they're having to deal with. Uh, it can happen through a person that's had a stroke uh, or something that's taken place. Like sometimes dementia, those uh, people that struggle with dementia, wrestle with this pseudo pull bar affect. It's an affect because the mood doesn't match the expression. In other words, they could be like at a kid's birthday party and just start weeping uncontrollably. They could be be at a funeral and just start laughing uncontrollably. The the, the expression of the mood uh, that you should have doesn't match the situation. Uh, It's it's also called incongruent affect or even emotional incontinence because you can't control the emotion that you're expressing. And I think in many ways, a lot of us are, I think that's kind of where we are spiritually. We've been through so much trauma in 2020 that it seems as we move into the new year, we're in this place spiritually right now. Should we be hopeful? Should we be grieving? Should we be happy? Should we be sad? Should we be, I don't know, fearful? Should we be expecting great things at the onset of 21? Maybe we have all these questions and, and I think that it's appropriate to have all of them. But I want to help you sort through some of these today. And, and I think that as we look into 2021, I think there's an appropriate mixture of both. Could that, could that be the case? And let's, let's kind of sort through that. We, we've grieved much in this past year. Last March, I remember talking with our staff and even with our leaders, we talked about it here, where there's, we, we need to stop and grieve. Because even then, people were saying that, you know, this is going to be a long, long return. And for many, again, saying that it's not going to be a return at all. There's this new normal everybody was talking about, right? This major shift. Some of us are still hope, hoping that things will go back to the way they were. And with a vaccine, we know that's hopeful. I can't wait to worship without a mask on, frankly. Singing with a mask on is a beatdown. But we're going to continue to follow the guidance and medical 
you know, advice and direction that we're receiving. We want anybody and everybody who would come to feel safe to be here. I want everyone to feel safe to be here to hear the message of the gospel and to come to Jesus and to be with us to worship. But many of us in March, you know, we kicked into fix-it mode, you know, as a lot of us did. And maybe we didn't grieve initially or, or and then, then throughout the entire summer, you might remember, if you've been with us, uh, we walked through the book of Daniel. And we talked about what it was to live in exile. Now, little do we know that when we planned that whole series, we were talking about living in exile in a post-Christian culture more and more. And we weren't talking about literally living in quarantine in exile. And so there was this kind of this multiple ways to apply this. But we looked at the people of Israel who had gone into exile far from home. And in Psalm 137, they asked the question when they were asked to play their instruments and sing. They said, how can we sing the songs of the Lord while in a foreign land? How can we do this? How can we worship God in the midst of a pandemic or in the midst of a place where we feel far from home, far from this Christian, Judeo-Christian worldview and culture that we feel like we're, we're losing in so many ways? And we, we said that, you know, grief is, is, is really the process. It's, it's a process of, of a beginning. There's a middle and, and there's an end. And, and many of us entered into denial, right? Many of us were... We're angry. Many of us blame shifted. Many of us just hunkered down. And, and we went through stages along this continuum of grief. And I, I want to say it again. Name it and call it out for what it is. It's what some of us are still feeling today. And I'm one of these who really does believe we're never going to go back to normal. Uh, not to pre-COVID. Not really. And many are saying in, in the stuff that I'm studying, my little world, or how about the big world of the church, many are saying the church will never go back to normal. Many are saying that, that even, even numbers, pre-COVID numbers, we're not going to see again in the church. Now, you know, again, who can say that? The Spirit of God moves and churches grow, and we're praying that our church will, will explode in the coming days as we remain faithful to Him. But see, I, I do believe with all that took place in 2020 and what's still happening in 21, I believe the Lord, I think what He's doing, He's refining His church is what He's doing. He's been refining his church. He's been, he's been separating us, those of us who are, want to be faithful to him, radically committed to him. And I believe he's continuing to do that. I grieve a lot of what we've lost. But I'm really hopeful for the future. And I think that we can all enter into this season and say, I don't know what's coming, but I want to commit my life fully to him. That's what I want to talk about today. You have been so faithful. I'm going to pause along the way this morning. And just, just celebrate what God's done. And, and we've, still, we've done that all along the way. But you as a church family have been faithful throughout the pandemic. I praise God for the way that you've stepped up to be a formidable force in our city. We have served those in need who've gone through the worst during this time. Dispelling the darkness and, and helping people come to Christ and to know his love through us. You know, our, our, our major shift has been this. Like many of you right now, thousands are watching online. And, and we've seen more and more people have been engaged. And we know it's not like being in person. We know that. But the message is still heard. And we, we saw some 5,000 people or so just, just con Christmas Eve connect with us. Uh, and, and we're estimating somewhere around 12, 15,000 people connected with us, engaged in some way, some form. And we celebrate that. And we praise God for that. These are numbers we've never seen here before. And we'll continue to gather and we'll continue to share our message across the city and around the world. And as a cross-generational church, we celebrate that we're reaching an even more younger and younger crowd all the time as we've got to pass the gospel on to the next generation. We want to talk about that today. So as we move into 21, should we weep or should we rejoice? There's an interesting passage in the book of Ezra. Um, and I just want to look at it just briefly before we dive into really what will be the outline for this sermon today. But there's a place in Ezra where the people are coming back out of exile. Okay, some of us kind of feel that way. Maybe in 21, we're coming out of exile, coming back. And they were coming back to the temple. They've been in exile, coming back now. And they gathered all the worship leaders together and all the priests in their vestments and symbols. And they were coming to praise the Lord as David, the king of David, had directed them, it, it says, as he had taught them how to worship. And then in verse 11, it says this. You can see it there. They sang responsively, praising and giving thanks to God, for he is good. We've sung about that today. He is steadfast. It's Steadfast love endures forever toward, toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord. Because sometimes, y'all, shouting is an appropriate way to praise him. Yes, he's good. 
and we pray. We need more shouting. We need more joyful praise in his presence because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. So they, they've come back, okay? They're excited about what's happened. It seems the majority of all the people are gathered around, and there's this maybe this sense of normalcy. We're back home, and yes, the temple destroyed. Now the foundation's been laid. They're giving praise. They're joyful. But then watch what happens. They are praising God for the new foundation. Then verse 12, it says, But many of the priests and Levites and heads of, of fathers' houses, that is, old men, who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy. Okay, so the young men are singing praise, the majority of the people, it seems, singing praise to God. The old men are weeping out loud, collectively as a people, a congregation, they're experiencing a kind of pseudo bull bar effect. Are we weeping or are we crying? What is appropriate here? Some of you are weeping and the rest of us are rejoicing. We're celebrating what is happening in verse 13 so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout and the sound was heard from far away. People listening, think about this. There's this intermingling, this mixture of weeping and praise. I think this is probably appropriate to where we are. Some young men, the, the young men, the young people are singing, praising God for what he's doing. And then the older people are weeping over the past, not, no longer here. And I think, friends, this is not just appropriate for us today. This has always been the case. Every generation, we kind of look back. We all, as we get older, we have a bias toward the past. We look back and we say, well, you know, back in my day, things were really, people, everyone loved Jesus back in my day. And these young people, they, you know, we, I mean, we all, we've always done this. And, and what I want you to see today, that even today, I think any time we gather, on any given Sunday, there are those who, let's, you know, it's those of us who come weeping. Those of us who come praising and shouting and, and celebrating the Lord. Those who have great faith and who are celebrating his, the, his grace. That we are encouraged by that. That's why so many of us are struggling because we miss being together. When I come here on Sunday mornings and I'm like, man, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm hurting. And yet the praise of God's people helps me to get out of the funk and to worship him. But these saints, like in Ezra's day, they're kind of spiritually inverted. And many of them are are grieving over what has been instead of looking forward to what shall be. Don't be one of them. And I just want to challenge, primarily, it can be, I know, a personality bent or something, but I'm talking about those of us who are older, older who are prone to look back, to look back at the past. Listen, God is done with the past. He's not working in the past. He's already done that. We can celebrate his faithfulness. He's at work now, and he's at work into the future. A church is constantly passing the gospel on to the next generation. That's what was happening here. So as we come out of exile, if you will, we need more and more of us, and, and people my age and older, old people like me saying, we're passing the gospel on to the next generation because that's what matters. And I just want to pause and celebrate those who've done that this year. And I think it's appropriate for me to say this, because I, like a lot of you, I could not have made it through the year without certain people in my life. I mean, number one is my wife, Stacy. I could not have made I couldn't be where I am without her. I couldn't be where I am without a group of friends that I do life with, who I'm accountable to every single day. I, I couldn't do this without my, my mom, who I talk to regularly and encourages me all the time. I've got longtime friends. I have a group of friends in high school. We still are constantly connecting with each other, encouraging God, calling each other out. And, and I, I couldn't make it, and, and I could not have made it here without a certain group of leaders. And I just want, a lot of you don't even know these people's names, but I just praise God for Randy Perry, who served as our chair of, of Board of Trustees. Uh, and, and I praise God for Laura Dronzik, who's been our chair of our deacons this past year. Keith Beasley, who's been our vice chair. I praise God for Bill McCann, who served as our personnel chair, and John Michael Kretz, who, who guided our finance committee as we sought to say, what are we going to do with it? Maybe a six-month you know, projected, how are we going to pivot, right? How are we going to turn? I, I could go on and on. Ken Holden, our treasurer, has been a great help during this time. And all of these people and many more, when I challenged this core group of leaders to say, would you stay on for another year just to bring continuity in the midst of uncertainty and change? And they said, yes, we'll do it for the sake of the body, for the sake of the church. And without them, I couldn't, we couldn't have made it through this time. And so I praise God for our church family. And, 
And they all agreed to extend their time and with a lot of work, a lot of prayer and for the sake of Christ and for the sake of you. So I just want to pause and say thank you to them. And I praise God for each one. And I also want to say that our entire staff has done such a great job. And it's just a, it's appropriate to stop and celebrate. And they've had an unrelenting um, you know, commitment to the Lord and to his church in a, in a very difficult time. And I just want to publicly thank Rodney Shell. I want to thank Corey Thurman and, and Brandon Boyd, those who've walked with these leaders I've mentioned, walked with me during this time, uh, could not have made it without them. And so today, I just, I just want to say thank you. And I want us now to turn our, our hearts toward a message for the entire church, is why I'm talking to everybody right now in our entire church family. And I want to say this. I know I'm online. We get a lot of people watching us from all over the world, literally. I'm a pastor of a local church. That's what I do. Uh, I speak to a specific people in a specific place and a specific collective gathering that God has brought together. We're different than a church across the street or down the road because God has brought us this collective potential of people together for his purpose. And, and, and today I have a word for our people. So if you're a guest, listen in because you'll hear a, a lot of what we're about and where we're heading. But I just want to say that. I'm not, this is not a platform for you know some global you know. Warren Ministries or something. This is, this is, I'm a local pastor, and I have a love of people, and I'm a shepherd of the people. So uh, where we're heading, let me just lay out a some, some, uh, bit of where we're, we're going together. If I could gather all of our leaders together, every member of our church together, and say, listen, let's all give, give the downbeat to where we're heading this year. This is it right here, because I'm so glad that you're here and listening today. We're going to talk, uh, our theme throughout the year is really this word, beyond. Okay, we're entering into this series this next week that's going to set the stage because we're going to move beyond uh, a, a God that we put in a box and we're going to look at God and who he really is. We're going to move beyond ourselves in serving others. We're going to be, move beyond just Sunday Christianity as God's refining his church. We're going to be moving beyond just doing church and instead discipling one another. We're going to move beyond you know, a, a cultural Christianity that's, that's, that's guided by the latest news feed or being discipled by what's on our screens. Instead, we're going to be discipled by the word of God, forging friendships with one another, intentionally discipling one another, living our lives on mission. And today I want to ask the question yet again, what will it be for you this year? I want you to be thinking about your role in what it means to be faithful. What will you give your life to this year? I want you to think about that with me. You know, uh, as we think about success in 21, what will it be for you? And I just want to encourage you to take some time to think about your life. Often, you know, I'll, tra I'll challenge myself, my family, our staff to it. Maybe a single word that says, here's my focus this year. And here's how I can you know, find scripture around that. Here's how I'm going to guide and lead my life. I want to encourage you to do that. For me in 2020, I've talked about this publicly, but my word was presence. Uh, really wanting to live in the Lord's presence every day and then be a faithful presence in the lives of others. And I figured that would be success for me. Because we said it this way. In a word, success in the Christian life is faithfulness. That's it. And we leave the results to him. Just be faithful to what he's called us to one day at a time. That will be a faithful life. Think about it, right? You, you lay your head on the pillow at night and you're like, that's success for me. I'm going to seek to do the same in 21. And I want to seek to challenge you to do the same. I want to call our entire church family and you personally to determine what a faithful life will look like for you every single day. And I believe it's simply pursuing him and it's one day at a time. And I want to talk about how we, we are to bless others in our lives in these days, all right? We say it this way, you have been blessed to be a blessing. And when I'm talking about blessed, and I'm not talking about blessed like, you know, like some, you know, prosperity gospel, you know, if I give this, God's going to give me tenfold, and if I do this, he's going to do this. Like he's some big vending machine in the sky, he's the Amazon man, he's going to just come, I just click something, he's going to come at me. No, I'm talking about the fact that he's blessed every one of us with his gifts that we then resource for him. We are a conduit of blessing with all that he's given us. Then we give to others, give our gifts, our times, our resources, our, 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 our houses, our apartments, whatever God's given us, our personalities. So the theme for this year is found in John 1, 16, kind of a theme verse, and it's this. And from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace, fullness of his grace to then bless others. And we're going to bless our families, our cities, uh, or our city, our, our, our communities, our neighbors. How will we do this? All right, how will we be a blessing to others in 21? 
I want you, I want you to know this. You're going to live your best, best year ever if you will apply this simple message today. And here it is. Here's, here's the premise of it all. Success, okay, in life is faithfulness to him, faithfulness to one another, and faithfulness to his mission. What else are you going to give your life to that's more important than that? What else is more worthy of your time? What else matters in eternity? And so as we walk through this now, the remaining of our time together, I want to celebrate, praise God for you, and worship uh, him with you as we walk through the hardest year ever. I want to cast a little vision into 21. So again, if I could gather everybody around our people together and say, let's, let's get after this and let's start today. Let me give the downbeat to us. I want you to determine your role in the midst of all this. Because I know this. Uh, there's one thing for certain, uncertainty. But there's another thing that's certain, and it is a God who does not change. He is immutable. That's the word. He is unchanging. He's faithful. He's all wise. He's all powerful. And he's all loving. And so we're going to look at a few passages here, and you'll see them on the screen. But as we think about being faithful to him, being faithful to one another, being faithful to his mission, first, being faithful to him. In John 1, uh, verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This is a Christmas verse, right? Often. This is an everyday verse. We've seen his glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and full of truth. And here, here's my point. Christmas had taught us that yet again that God's whole purpose in redemptive history was to, to bless us as his people. He blessed a, uh, Adam and Eve in the garden. Blessed them with his presence. Blessed them in the garden. Blessed them with all that they needed. Then they turned away from him and sinned against him just as we all have turned away from him. He sought to bless Abraham. So he called out Abraham in order to bless the nation Israel. And then ultimately through them, then he would bless the entire world. He forms a people to bless so that they would be a blessing. Not, not, not an end to terminate on them, but to bless the nations. This has always been his plan. You see this? So he blesses then through the Davidic line. He blesses all the world with Jesus, the Messiah who comes. He blesses us with salvation. He gives us his spirit gives us gifts so that we will bless the world. He's given us blessings to bless others. And so then in John 1.18, it says, No one has ever seen God, the only Father, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Jesus has made him known to us. And so we know that through Christ then, we see God. All right? And so we're going to be over the, in January, we're going to be talking about this, this whole idea of beyond, that God's beyond what we've made him out to be. See, 2020 has been difficult, but it's also been revealing. And here's my premise as we move into this next series, and I want you to come next week. Invite friends to come. Don't miss a week, because what we're going to be doing is talking about who God is, the attributes or characteristics of God, because our small God has created big problems in our lives. And if 2020 showed us anything, we're not sure who we're worshiping. I mean, we, we worship a God who has revealed himself, and, and he is, for many of us, the God we worship is not God enough. And we're going to start next week by looking at who this God is. It's going to be an incredible time. A.W. Tozer wrote that there's a condition in the church that is steadily growing worse and worse. And it's what he called the concept of majesty from the popular religious mind. He says the church has surrendered her once lofty concept of God and has substituted it for one so low, so ignoble, as to be utterly unworthy of thinking, worshiping people. This was in 1961. And it's only gotten worse. He says the only way out is to rediscover the majesty of God. And then he offers that famous line. What comes into our minds when we think of God is the most important thing about us. And for many of us, our tiny God has created giant problems in our lives. And so we're going to look every week, we're going to look at who God is, the high view of almighty God. And it's going to be a great time as we worship in together. And I just want you to commit right now, watching there at home, you know, connect with us there online. You can, you know, again, go to that QR code. You can, you can connect with us to get involved in a connect group. The groups that are meeting by way of Zoom, start a group, do life together. We'll have classes to help you. We're going to walk in prayer. We're going to make disciples will be our focus. And everybody has a part in this. We're going to make Jesus known. We're going to bless the whole wide world. 
Because this good news has come for all people, and it starts right where you are, right in the home. So we're going to be faithful to him every single day. We're going to be faithful to who he really is, and we're going to be faithful to one another. All right, And it goes on in John 13. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Here's my point. You know, it really does start here uh, in a church that's, that's marked by grace. If, if we're marked by anything, I believe that we're a people marked by grace. We seek to love one another as he has loved us. Think about it. Our love is so radical that we love one another just like Jesus loves us. And a watching world sees that and they wonder what is going on. And what's happening is it points to the love of God for us. He says we're going to love each other and the world's going to know we belong to him. So a watching world is blessed as we love and as we welcome them in, as we bless one another, we become the answer to Jesus' prayer. Toward the end of his life in John 17, the glory that you've given me, I've given to them. Imagine that. The glory that he has, he gives to us that they may be one, even as we are one. Even as the Trinitarian God is one in them and you and me, I and them and you and me, that they may become perfectly one. So that, here it is, the world may know that you sent me and love them even as I, as you have loved me. So he's called us to be one. So, so how will we do this? Well, we're going to raise up the next generation to love God as we love them, as we give our lives to one another. We're going to see in, in 2021, you know, what we're going to see more and more of, I believe, are parents who realize in 2020, if I'm not discipling my kids, nobody is. Or let me, let me say it this way. No, somebody is. And, and for many of us, our screens, you know, social media, what we see online, it's digital Babylon, is discipling our kids. Just our screens are forming us and shaping us. So we've got to work harder than ever as parents, and we've got to train up parents to give them tools to raise their kids up in the Lord and keep talking about his love for them. As they live in this digital Babylon, they need to come face to face with the word of God and see it in the parents lived out. And we're a church that's helping, uh, helping parents and guiding them as never before. As a church, we're going to love each other. We're going to celebrate one another. We're going to prefer one another. We're going to grieve with one another. We're going to check on one another. And friends, let's continue to do that. We're going to teach and train one another as people uh, that, that see us love one another. They're going to want to get in on that. And we will first be faithful to him. We're going to be faithful to, to one another. And then finally, we're going to be faithful to his mission. At Matthew 28, 18 through 20, our church, I guess you need to know that our church is built on this passage, on Christ's last commission. It's called the Great Commission, the co, the with mission, the with Jesus mission. And he's called us to this mission, and many of us know it. Let's say it together. You can see it on the screen there. Let's read this together out loud. And right at home, you can read it with us. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Catch that. He's with us now and always to the end of the age. We walk with him daily. Now what's happening here is there's a singular, the way this breaks down in the Greek, in the syntax of the Greek, there's a singular command here, imperative command. And it is to make disciples. And then there are what we would call in English three qualifying participles, okay, I-N-G words we have in English, that, do, that qualify the main verb. How are we going to do this? And they are, you've seen it before, here it is. We make disciples by going, by baptizing, and by teaching. So we go intentionally, Right? And in Acts 1.8, there's a reiteration of this commission where Jesus says you're going to start, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you're going to start in Jerusalem. Why? That's where they were, right? You start where you are. Every one of us starting where we are. We go intentionally. We go across the room intentionally into relationships. We go across the street. We go, go across uh, the office. We go to people intentionally to see how we can reach them. And then it says baptizing them. Now, this implies evangelism. This implies that they've come to Christ. 
And, and so we, we baptize. And, and what we're going to do this year, we're going to enter into this uh, a, a season as a church family. And again, I'm talking to our church family. And we're going to memorize and practice a simple acrostic in order to, to, to love others well. And it's the acrostic bless. We're going to seek to bless others. We're going to bless others. And we're going to begin with prayer. All right? We're going to begin with prayer. We're going to listen well. We need a lot more listening in our culture today. We're going to eat with them. We're going to, we're going to spend time getting to know or have a, have a cup of coffee. We're going to spend personal time with people as, as things open up more and more. Okay, We're going to serve them in a specific way, people that we're seeking to love, really love genuinely, and to serve them in a way that, that meets needs. And then we're going, to, we're going to share. We're going to share with them our own story of how we came to Christ. If you've come to Christ, you have a story. And then within that story wrapped up is the big story of the gospel that's changed our lives. And we're going to teach everybody in our church how to share the gospel in simple ways, like a simple verse like Romans 6, 23, where the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. And there's a real simple way to talk about how Christ has changed our lives. We're going to do this joyfully. We're going to do it together. And we're, we're going to hold fast to values that drive us, like the gospel that is central in everything we do, because here it is. We're all about Jesus. We are all about Jesus, and I just want to proclaim these together. We, we are gospel-centered, Jesus-centered. Grace will guide everything that we do. I've referenced that a little bit, because we believe everybody's somebody. Everybody is welcome here, and we believe that unity is critical, because we're all in this together. And the mission of Jesus is what unites us, his love for us. And we're going to continue to express an overflowing generosity. We, we share all that we have. Everybody has something to share. And everybody does their part. And, and, and we're going to continue to live this life together. And we're going to continue to be innovative in a time when we've got to be. Courageous innovation will guide us because we take courageous risks here. And we will continue to do so. We will be innovative, intentional, and creative in order to reach people who have not yet reached. How about this? If you're going to reach people you haven't yet reached, you've got to do things you're not yet doing. So as it says, they said in the chosen, if you've seen that, get used to different. Because this is how we're going to reach the next generation in this cultural moment. And we believe that all that drives us is a sense of urgency. Because we're running out of time. We're running out of time. And our clock tower reminds us every single time we pass by, every time you look, that night is coming. Jesus said it. He said, night's coming when you no longer be able to do the works of the Father. Friends, we have a moment in time. And I believe not just now that we're, and this is a good time to talk about this, in a new year coming, we've got a moment in time. Not just in our own personal lives that are fleeting like that. We've got another year. We've got to capture what God is doing, catch the wave of his work in the world. But I believe that we're running out of time with a generation where we've seen a shift. And with every successive generation, we see folks moving further and further away from a Judeo-Christian worldview, and further away from the gospel in the church. And research bears it out. We've got a moment in time. We've got to move with a sense of urgency and, and determine it's not about me. It's not about my preferences. It's not about what I want. It's about reaching the next generation and the next, making disciples. Because there are those who are saying, I, want to, I, I just need somebody to disciple me. I'm all in. And we've got to give our hearts and give our uh, necessary tools to, to the next generation. And so truth does not change, but the way we present truth has got to change. With every generation, always has. So we're going to continue to raise up young leaders. We've got, we, we've got a vision for emerging leaders, a robust internship program and, and ministry here, and a residency program. And we're raising up a next generation of pastoral leaders in our pastoral center, church pastoral center, sending out church planners. And we're going to continue to do all that we can as a church. And, and we move into 21. I think, I think perhaps the image out of Ezra still applies. A, a kind of pseudo bull bar affect that we're experiencing today. Will you laugh or will you cry? Will you rejoice? Will you dance or will you weep? Will you hold on to the past or will you project the past into the future, which always leads to fear and shame? What will you do? Will we weep over what was or will we rejoice in the new thing that he's doing? Because he's always doing a new thing. And friends, let me just say it this way. If we weep, let us weep over our sin. 
And if we weep, let us weep over our broken world. If we weep, let us weep over our friends who don't know the joy of salvation. If we weep, let us weep over the fact that they're burdened by sin and the wrath of God that comes upon sin. And let us weep over the need for us to share the gospel with a lost and dying world. And if we rejoice, let us rejoice in those things he rejoices in. Let us rejoice in the salvation that has come to the world that we get to share. If 2020 taught us anything, it's revealed that we live in a broken world. We're desperate for God to intervene. We've learned that politics can't rescue us. We've learned that, that even our medical expertise will not save us. Only Christ will rescue us. And so when you think about it, the entire Christian life is a kind of pseudo bull bar effect. <laughs> Where we, we live in this paradox of rejoicing while weeping. Singing in the midst of a pandemic. Dancing in the midst of trial and struggle. Because we know who holds our lives. And we know who holds the future. And we will not grieve as those who have no hope. We grieve as those who have hope. And we will live out the paradox of the gospel. And it's this. We're more sinful than we've ever imagined. And yet we're more loved than we can ever fathom. And we will be faithful to him as we first are faithful to him every single day. Faithful to one another and faithful to his mission. What else will you give your life to? What else matters when you stand before God Almighty someday? What will be success for you in 21? Give your life to him. There's nothing else to give your life to. There's nothing better than him. So let's determine together. What do you say, church? Let's be faithful to him. Let's be faithful to one another. Let's commit today to be faithful to his mission. Let's pray together as we close. Lord God, we thank you. You've spoken uh, into our hearts today. We thank you that you've been doing so for so long. And I thank you, Lord, for how you have, have reached out into our hearts today to, to get us back on course, maybe to set our hearts on you in special, uh, specific ways. And I pray now for those who are watching, maybe uh, you don't know him. You talk about focusing on him. You don't even know exactly what that means right where you are. And others of you who are with me, who know the Lord Jesus, pray with me now. As I pray for those of you who don't know him, would you give your life to him right now? Don't let another day go by. Give your life to him to say yes to him. He died on the cross for you so that you could be set free from your sin and the fear of the future so that you could give your life to him who holds your life and holds the future. And so, Lord, we give you our lives anew to be faithful to you, to be faithful to one another. Let us love and, and forgive and encourage, build up one another in these days and let it start at home and those closest to us. And then we'll be faithful to your mission, find our place in it and serve you with all of our lives. And that will be success for us as a church family and as individuals. So we love you and we give our lives to you. In Jesus' name, amen.